normally start with a half hour or so of guided meditation. And today's theme is called bringing a light heart to practice. So we'll try and bring some light attention also to the meditation. So that means a heart which is joyful or at least has some sense of enthusiasm and um, a kind of levity and a sense of contentment rather than bringing all our baggage and logging all our loads straight onto the cushion with us. We try to leave some of that outside the door, literally and figuratively. So we'll start with that. And then I'll give a Dhamma reflection on that theme, whatever's coming to my mind today around that. And, um, and then we'll end with some opportunity for question and answers, as I explained. So if you want to ask that live, you're most welcome and your voice will be on the recording, but not your picture. OK, so if you prefer to be uh, anonymous, please just write a question in the chat box if you wish. Or it can be feedback or just anything you'd like to share with the group. It's a very friendly space. Uh, many of us have been on the retreat with Ajahn Brahm just last week. And even some of you, I think, have been on with Ajahn Brahmali, most probably, at least two of our co-hosts. <laughs> but it's nice to be back with the gang. So there's also some lovely messages in the chat box. You're welcome to put them in there. Say where you're from, how you're feeling. Yeah. Great. I can see a few people have said hi. Christchurch, New Zealand. Amazing. So it's the next day for you. Gosh. Janaki. Wow. This is the first time I think we've had a New Zealander at the session. That's really wonderful. Good. So just settling in to your place. And making that place inviting and as comfortable as you can. So that meditation is not necessarily associated with discomfort. In fact, not at all. But you create this really positive association between meditation and time to rest. So sitting on a cushion or on a chair, maybe even a sofa or a bed. For those with chronic health conditions, you can even choose to lie down. Or if you're very weary and it just feels like too much pressure sitting up, there'll be a slight chance you'll sleep. <laughs> but sometimes sleep's also what the body needs. So just check in with yourself, first of all, kindly and inquisitively, asking your body what your body needs. And sensing that holding that the ground, the chair, the mat provides. How the gravity enables you to really let everything hang down. Let the earth take your load. Both the physical load, the tension, tightness, any holding, contraction. And you may even wish to offer any mental loads, unnecessary burdens. Offer them too into the ground. Getting a sense of the space around you. I'm not sure in Portugal if you're outdoors. For most of us, we're between walls in a room. See if you can tune into the space and notice in that space all the things you've left behind.
Notice what's missing. And sense if there's any lightness, spaciousness, relief, even joy in that. Breathing in spaciousness, lightness, joy. Breathing out, letting go of any burdens. Noticing what feels comfortable in the breathing. Whether it's a longer or a shorter breath. Noticing any resonance that the in-breath carries. Perhaps it's energizing effects. Or a sense that you're breathing in from this vast space around you. blessed by the benevolence of the universe. And again, noticing the emotional resonance including any effects in the body of breathing out. Calming, relaxing, releasing effects of the outbreath. As though with every breath, you're at once becoming lighter and letting go of any burdens, any holding on. Thoughts arise, just let them in. 
They pass all of themselves. Uninvited, they come in. Without permission, they leave. Not me, not mine, not a self. So letting those thoughts be like very light clouds in this vast spacious sky of the mind. Notice how you're relating to the breathing. Is there any effort to grab or possess? To think ahead, to lurch into the future, the next breath. Or can this breath simply be enough. And what kind of attention enables the breath to stay comfortably settled in your presence. Can there be just a very light touch? Perhaps as though your awareness were like a butterfly landing on a leaf. In the same way a gentle, friendly awareness. Simply rests, alights on the breath. Hardly disturbing it at all. So the breath barely knows that you're there.
allowing the breath of freedom to breathe through you, to play. to delight in the presence of your warm, loving awareness. Knowing that it's welcome to stay as long as it wishes to. I'll be quiet and let you practice in silence until the end of the meditation. I'm just seeing if you can maintain that light touch, tuning in with kindness and warmth, listening deeply to whatever arises in your mind, whether it's the breath, body sensations or emotions. The most important thing is the way that you're aware.
So we're coming close to the end of the meditation period. How do you feel now? Is there a feeling of spaciousness in the mind? Perhaps a slight lightening of the load. Either emotionally or also felt in the body. I'd like to invite you to just gently spread kind awareness through the body as if welcome, welcoming your body part by part back into the room. Smiling inwardly. Really appreciating your body and your mind for offering yourself this opportunity to let go. To find a moment of peace, a moment of calm. Contented with the results of your meditation, whatever they are. So when you're ready, staying connected to your body, especially connected to any feelings of pleasure, relaxation or delight. Or perhaps any sensations which help you to feel grounded and present for yourself and in this Zoom room, staying connected to that embodied sense. And if you wish, you can gently open your eyes. Hopefully no one's floated off into the sky and <laughs> become disembodied. <laughs> I don't think so. Hopefully there's not much danger of that. <laughs> it's really strange sometimes how these meditations go because I actually intended to do something totally different. And I very, very rarely go straight to the breath, but I hope that was in some way helpful. Uh, and I think it's important in all of these methods, you know, not to have certain expectations or to feel you have to get it right or get it a certain way. Um, because whatever manifests is what needs to be seen for you right there and then. So they're only ever suggestions, but it was nice for me because I figured out that I was holding a bit of tension and just being able to breathe through it and really kind of take in the spaciousness around me, help me to let go on that out breath. It was uh, more like a personal guided meditation. <laughs> it's kind of strange how that happens sometimes. So the reason for this talk is actually two reasons. I guess recently I've been having a lot of fun and lightness and playfulness with my teacher, Ajahn Brahm. Uh, <laughs> my co-host Anne-Marie, Derek and Mel were in on that during the retreat because there was one particular time before the session that um, I told him I'm not having a lot of fun anymore because I'm on my own. There's no one to really laugh with, you know, and it's kind of you get bored of entertaining yourself. And you don't try to entertain yourself, but, you know, we're conditioned a certain way. And after a while, 
It's like just hearing your own in a conversation can be pretty tiresome. So I said this to him and he just started giggling and really I mean, chuckling, full belly laugh it became. And uh, it was so contagious. So for about five minutes or, or more before we actually entered the Zoom room with everyone else, we were just chuckling. And one of the co-hosts also got the giggles eventually. The rest were too busy looking at what they had to do next. <laughs> but it was interesting because then the next um, interview I had with my teacher, it was a very similar thing. We were laughing so much. And I said to him, you know, it was great when we laughed together in that call the other day. He said, oh, yeah. <laughs> he said, don't start me. And we started again. He said, oh, don't stop me off. <laughs> it was actually quite hard to stop. And I think this is a product of a light heart, you know, somebody who doesn't take things too seriously and can very easily laugh for actually no reason at all. <laughs> so this was really lovely and a very lovely way to connect uh, with that spiritual companionship, which maybe sometimes we feel we have to make serious, you know, we have to ask the right questions and talk about the Dhamma and not waste people's time, right? Don't waste time. But actually, sometimes what's needed is just that company and that lightness to give a beautiful, friendly, warm-hearted context for your practice. And the other reason that I wanted to uh, talk about this today is because I heard a very inspiring talk by Ajahn Suchito. And there's one sentence he said a few times in some of his talks, and it's always stayed in my mind. And that is that meditation is far too important to take seriously. And I was like, it's a bit like a koan, isn't it? I was sort of thinking, what exactly does that mean? Because meditation is about coming out of suffering. It's about serious things like life and death. You know, not only one life and death, but theoretically many lives and deaths. I mean, that's big stuff that we have to work hard to get out of, right? And my own first teacher, um, Esen Goenka, who I will always feel incredibly grateful toward, his um, whole sort of approach to practice in a way, before you got onto the equanimity and the impermanence, he used to have this one phrase and he'd say, you have to fight out your own battles. You have to do your own work. You have to fight out your own battles. No one else can fight for you or fight them out for you. And now from this other perspective, you know, that I've, I've learned through people like Ajahn Brown and hearing those sort of uh, comments by teachers like Ajahn Suchito. And I guess through my own experience of just developing more meta over the years, it just sounds wrong to say this is time to fight out your own battles. Surely that's what we do every day of our life. You know, we fight with others, we fight with uh, our boss or our employees, we fight with our spouse, we fight with our friends, you know, we fight with ourselves, right? We always have these voices going around telling us we should be better, we should have known better, you know, get it together, come on. <laughs> and the last thing you want to be doing when you start the meditation practice is taking all those same attitudes onto the cushion, because basically you're taking yourself into the room. You know, you're going into your meditation with a big sense of self and quite a damaged sense of self often that feels it needs to improve. You know, we're not good enough and that's why we come to the practice because we need to get better. We need to be kinder, be, be more than we are right now. And yet counterintuitively, the whole path starts when we can actually meet ourselves exactly where we are right this minute with exactly the conditioning that we've had. I mean, how can it be any other way, right? So I just think it's wonderful to think about meditation as being far too important to take seriously, because to me that suggests that we can really crush it, we can destroy it, we can bring kind of a shackles and chains around our practice if we bring too much of this sense of self and this wanting to get it right. And we literally squeeze the lifeblood out of our practice, we squeeze out the joy, you know, until there's, it's just another task, it's just another thing that we have to get right. Quite sadly, I um, did hear from a couple of um, nuns who disrobed quite recently, and it was interesting to hear their story because one of them actually said that um, the weight of expectations was the main reason for her to leave. And I thought that was so sad because often as we presume that everybody else has expectations upon us, and quite often that's the case, especially in a leadership role, and especially as a nun, you know, especially forging new territory. Um, but also, you know, that weight of expectation is often something we internalize and we 
present to ourself, right? We put very high expectations on ourselves, far higher than we would put on anybody else. And eventually this all becomes too much. She also said that it was hard to just relate to people like as peers, you know, just as friends. And again, this is why we need in any walk of life, we need just people who we can laugh with, who we can relax with and be ourselves. Whether that's fellow monastics or, you know, friends or colleagues, you need that recess time to get together and just be off form, not be in your role at that point, but just be human beings who can share pretty much the same struggles and anxieties and depressions that we all go through. You know? And then another nun who also disrobed fairly recently said that she just always felt she had to be the perfect nun. You know, and again, that's that expectation, this sort of sense that we should be an idealized version of what we are. You know, we need to be better, we need to get it right. And how many times are we scared of making mistakes? Actually, mistakes can be quite endearing. I mean, Ajahn Brahm often puts his foot in his mouth, and so do I, I mean, quite, quite a lot. But luckily, I've got a teacher who allows that and who's there for me no matter what. And this can be so relaxing and, and um, such a relief to, to be human and get it wrong. And that getting it wrong is part of growing, right? It's called falling forward. So you fall flat on your face, but you've fallen ahead of yourself. So when you get up, you're a step ahead, ideally. I don't say that we all should put ourselves through unnecessary difficulties and challenges, you know. Certainly the Buddha talked about having um, conducive conditions to practice. So if we can be in conditions which nurture us and which bring out our best, then we should look for those conditions. But we're bound to make mistakes in any context and that's okay. You know, often we, uh, again, can forgive others, but we have a hard time forgiving ourselves. Yeah? We don't see that we actually made the best decision we could given the situation at the time, given the choices that were available to us, yeah? and given our own conditioning. We may be conditioned to keep on making the same choice time and again, simply because we don't see another way to go. And sometimes it takes that other person, either a good friend or you know, a good influence in your life to show you that another way is possible. So I think considering that, you know, it can be much easier to forgive past mistakes, realizing that, yeah, at that time I did the best I could. Perhaps now, knowing what I know now through making that mistake, right? Because you wouldn't know if you hadn't made it. Now you've made it, you know better, and that will inform your decision next time. Ajahn Brahm also always says, don't worry too much about the decisions you make, but put more effort, more energy into making them work. Because we can, you know, struggle endlessly thinking, should I do this or should I do the other? What happens if, what happens? What if I ruin my life by deciding to do something that doesn't work out? One of the joys of renunciation is you often don't have much of a choice. I mean, I was asked to come over here by Ajahn Brahm, and I can assure you that if I'd have thought about it at any depth, I probably wouldn't have come. <laughs> also, if I'd have known what I was in for, I might not have come. So sometimes it's a good job we don't know because great things, you know, actually manifest when we take the plunge. It was the same thing even when I heard Ajahn Brown for the first time. I was actually in Burma and I had a teacher who I wanted to stay with basically indefinitely. Um, but my health was failing badly and it had been for three or four years to the point that I couldn't even keep food down anymore. I was very, very thin. I was eating rice gruel, really disgusting, sort of cooked on some kind of smoky fire. So it tasted burned, but it had no, no salt and very thin. And this was all I was eating and it wouldn't stay down. You know? And uh, I heard Ajahn Brahm talks I didn't know who he was and these were the kind of powerful reigns talks that he gave in the early 2000s late 90s and I just thought I've got to find this teacher he was speaking to where I was at it felt like some kind of serendipity you know and uh, I just knew I had to go so it did take a couple of months but there were lots of signs along the way sort of suggesting that yes indeed this might be a, a timely thing to do and um I didn't even know if he would train me as a nun. I took the plunge, I took the leap, a leap of faith. And trust is something so important, isn't it, to lightness, you know, feeling that we are, uh, we can trust in our good intentions, we can trust in our values in life. 
and if we can align our actions, our thought, words, and deeds with those values as far as possible, trusting that something good will come out of that. So, you know, you can look back and think what would have happened if, but that wastes so much energy and definitely creates a heavy head. So for the sake of lightness, I think trust is something beautiful. And um, another lovely quote from Ajahn Suchito from one of his talks was that what's really helpful in meditation is we have to have a basic sense that we can fly. And I just loved that um, sort of simile and that, that imagery you know, you're sort of sitting there on your cushion, you don't know what's going to happen, you're closing your eyes, you know, am I going to get it right? Have I been taught properly? Um, <laughs> what's going to come up? Am I just going to feel worse afterwards? You know, I don't want to sit here with this anxiety or this wandering mind. But just trust that you're something so much bigger than that. This is just the ego talking, the limited sense of self, you know, and if you carry that onto your cushion, and believe in those voices and those fears, then of course you're just burdening yourself unnecessarily, really weighing yourself down. So he says that trust is like this sense that you have wings and you can fly. And I really love that because this is how the practice starts to work after some time when we really come from a place of right intention. This was the other thing I wanted to talk about. To try and align our, the way we relate to everything that's arising, you know, whether in our lives or in our minds with the three right intentions of basically letting go or renunciation, nekama, and then avyapada, which literally means non-ill will. It's a simile for loving kindness. And the third right intention is avihimsaka, yeah, which means non-cruelty, slightly different from non-ill will. So the way that uh, Ajahn Brahm likes to translate non-cruelty is gentleness, yeah. And this is kind of learning to handle things with that light touch. Yeah. So the letting go, first of all, is a whole thrust of the path. This is the direction we're moving in in practice. We're unburdening, we're taking off loads. And it's not that we're rejecting experience. It's quite the opposite. I actually like to think of letting go as a kind of giving. You can give things up, of course, you know, you can actually abandon things which are harmful, but you can also give something beautiful to your meditation by simply connecting with this attitude of generosity, of openness and um, sort of charity, a charitableness of heart so that whatever arises, it's welcome, you know, and you can really give your attention, give your time to that. It's like being a good companion to whatever arises, being willing to sit with or walk with what's there. Stay with it, even if it's painful, without kind of rejecting it or pushing it away. So the letting go is a sort of product of this right intention. And I think it's important to just mention here that we don't jump straight to letting go. First, we have to learn to let be, right? To actually be with something so that it can open up and reveal, you know, its nature to us. And by nature, I don't mean some kind of like transcendent nature or original mind, but I just mean um, how these things arise, you know, that they are conditioned and that they do uh, come into being and pass away of their own accord, right? So we don't need to hold on. We don't need to grab or possess. We can't actually. It's really ironic, but sometimes we think we just like grab and possess the good stuff, but we even grab and possess the difficult stuff as well. You know, we love to hold on to our suffering. We love actually sometimes to feel heavy and to feel weighted down because that gives us a sense of being. It gives us a sense of like existing, right? So even the idea of becoming lighter, letting go of loads can be actually quite challenging to the sense of self because often there are things that, have defined us for so long, yeah? The person who needs to worry in order to get things right, the person who needs to make a lot of effort in order that things don't, you know, kind of collapse around us. This is who I am and I daren't let go and just even slightly loosen that grip because what will happen? How will I be if I just feel right? If there's really no problem, there's just a sense of contentment, then what is there for me to do, right? What is there for this doer to do? <laughs> so Ajahn Brown sometimes says that, you know, making effort is more about, um, what does he say? Well, he says wisdom power instead of willpower. 
So, and sometimes he says it's like the power to say no. So like restraining power. So I kind of like to call that won't power. <laughs> so it's more like I won't go down those roads in my mind that just lead to suffering. You know, I, I just uh, don't want to do that to myself anymore. Yeah, and the um, don't do power. <laughs> Can we dare to sit in our meditation and to do a little bit less? Yeah. Again, this is the beauty of learning teachings from people who've really embodied them and really understood the Dhamma at a deep level, because after a while, you know, they sort of brainwash you and convince you that you can do less and less and less in your meditation. And as long as you get these attitudes right, you know, as long as you're coming from that place of letting go of kindness and of gentleness, the process starts to happen on its own. Whatever arises in that field of warmth and love and you know, gentleness, and where we don't possess it, where we don't try to own it or hold on, it naturally starts to calm, starts to soften, even starts to disappear and fade. Yeah. You'll notice even in that short session of meditation, hopefully you've noticed, to some extent that the breath starts off maybe a little bit rough and after a while on its own it starts to settle down you don't ask it to settle down and if you would ask it to it would get even more tense you know? you'd start to have very irregular and jumpy uncomfortable breath but if we can just you know provide this loving atmosphere for the breath to flow in and out of then over this period of time in the practice we just start to tune up with the breath we don't have to go in and grab it. We don't have to like zap it with our awareness. We can more take the passive stance so that we become receptive to the breath. We open up to the breath. We invite the breath in to our mind. Yeah. One really lovely analogy is um, like preparing your mind to be like a beautiful inviting room with a hearth, maybe a fire. Maybe if you're like some of my friends, lots and lots of Christmas lights. <laughs> fairy lights or whatever it is and you put food on the table and you know lovely drinks and you create this really lovely warm jovial atmosphere and people want to come in right people just want to come in so in a similar way we create that kind of atmosphere in our mind and in our heart and things like the breath and even subtler objects will start to come in because our mind becomes more receptive less um uh, what's the word, prescriptive or less demanding about what it sees, about what's okay to allow. And we just start to tune up with what's there. And with this kindness and this uh, warmth, you'll start to find that you are creating, uh, it's almost like your attitude towards the objects, be the objects become the attitude, right? So it's like, if you relate to something from a place of peace, you literally make peace with something instead of fighting your battle. You look upon even anxiety by making peace with it. Then soon you'll find you're actually observing peace in the mind because the attitude starts to become so strong that it almost overpowers, um, I don't want to call it anything negative, but anything that sort of, <clears throat> how to say, I guess is leading away from the path of peace, leading you down a different direction because as human beings, it seems that we have this natural inclination to peace. You know, we're all looking for happiness. We're all looking to develop love, to develop joy. We don't always go about it in the right way, but nevertheless, we are actually inclining that way all the time. And sometimes it's just like getting a different sense for that. Like, the pleasures of the mind aren't the same as sensual pleasures. And at first we don't notice them there. You know, they can be very subtle, like an, more like an absence of something, more like space or spaciousness or the silence that comes in the mind. Yeah? At first that also feels a little bit, uh, can be almost scary and confronting to people when, the, when you just experience a silence in the mind at first. But after some time we listen into that and soften around it and find this incredible sense of peace and space in the silence, yeah? And bit by bit through this process, these things that we call the five hindrances are being gradually worn away, yeah? The five hindrances, the Buddha says, are those things which nourish delusion. They actually feed 
delusion, the root cause of all suffering, right? Delusion is the first link in dependent origination, avidya, often translated as ignorance. And the Buddha said that it doesn't have a first cause, but it does have nutriments, and those nutriments are the five hindrances. So as we start to practice in these five hindrances of craving, aversion, doubt, uh, restlessness, and, and sleepiness, laziness, they start to become um, weaker, and the mind starts to wake up. That means at that moment, there's less feeding the delusion. We are able to see more clearly and wisdom can arise. Yeah. So when we're able to see more clearly, we can clearly see or more clearly see that, you know, there is uh, nothing solid in here. You know, this idea we have about ourselves. I'm this person with this background, with this problem, with this trauma. Yeah. Or I'm the person that can never get it right. I can never meditate. Or I'm the person that had a great meditation on Ajahn Brahm's retreat, yeah? I'm the one that can get into jhanas. It's all based on what you've done in the past. You know, we're mistaking transient states that arise dependent on conditions for who we think we are. So once the delusion starts to lift and we can see more clearly, we see that everything that arises is arising due to a cause. I read a lovely quote, it was actually on Facebook, but never mind. It was from a Dhamma friend. And uh, I can't remember who said this quote, but I found it quite interesting. It said, trauma decontextualized over time looks like personality. Yeah. And then family trauma decontextualized over time looks like family traits. In other words, we think that, oh, this is how these people are in this family. This is who they are. And then it went on that community trauma decontextualized over time starts to look like culture. And I thought this was so fascinating. And I realized you could replace that first word trauma because I think all of us have had trauma to some extent, maybe some of us serious, severe trauma that's lasted for many years. And sometimes trauma can really affect even our you know, neurology and have lasting effects in the, the way the brain works. But there are little traumas that happen all the time. But we could also replace the word trauma just for conditioning, right? Any conditioning, conditioning from society, friends, the people we're around, our upbringing, of course, you know, even conditioning from, I don't know, obviously culture. So you could also say conditioning decontextualized over time looks like personality, right? Conditioning decontextualized over time looks like family traits or looks like culture when it's actually just conditioning. And the over time bit is interesting because I think that because of that lapse of time, we can forget how we got to where we are, that there are many, many causes that have led to us being this way. And over time, we can forget that actually Perhaps five years ago, I was actually much more, um, maybe more peaceful, more joyful if something traumatic has happened, or I was more trusting of others, or perhaps I was actually more irritable, you know, more frustrated in my life. So, but over time, new conditioning comes along and you change. So which one is the real you? The thing is, none of it is, right? And, and gradually, the more I practice, the more I realize that whatever we see in ourselves or in others is only a product of their conditioning. It's only a product of what they've gone through, yeah? And that has massive implications for things like conflict, yeah? And, and things like judging others, right? We can so easily say this person shouldn't have done that, shouldn't have, you know, they're a bit egotistical, they're a bit arrogant, whatever it is, but, when we understand that, you know, however people are presenting is, is due to conditions, and if we were in a similar situation, we may have become just like that, good or bad, right? And not only does it help us to not judge, but it can help us to develop empathy, because I think it's really important, especially in Buddhism sometimes, to talk about the positive qualities that we need to develop, and not only the negative ones we need to restrain, yeah? It's all very well to say, I'm not judging someone, most of the time we are, 
<laughs> because this is how we've been programmed. It can be much more honest in a way to say that I know I have this tendency to judge because then you have a chance to explore where that judgment is coming from, yeah? But to actually actively develop empathy, to try and put yourself in someone else's shoes, yeah? Sometimes we have to put ourselves in our own shoes in the sense that we actually can look upon ourselves as though we were that someone else. And how would we judge a friend who is going through what we're going through? Would we be quite so hard, harsh, demanding, exacting on them? Most probably not. So I find this really, really helpful. And uh, I was talking about the process of meditation, but this is one of the things that starts to happen. These five hindrances become uh, weaker and delusion starts to be overcome. So we can actually start to see how things are put together, the mechanics of the mind, if you like. And it's almost like delusion is like this big thick mist or a really thick fog that you can't see through, you know, and you lose all so, sort of perspective, any sense of perspective. You forget there's a tree over here or the road ends over here and a lot of traffic accidents are caused in fogs because we just don't see where we're going, right? And sometimes in England, you know, you can look up into the sky for day after day, week after week, and all you see is this massive, thick, overcast sky, really grey and heavy. And you can actually forget that there's this blue sky above. I think one of the reasons I love to travel so much is um, getting on that aeroplane <laughs> and getting through those thick clouds. And then you start to see there's all these fluffy light clouds and, uh, and like wispy clouds. And then above that, it's just pure blue sky, infinite sometimes really dark blue, if you look really up into space. And it's a little bit similar with this delusion, you know, we, we, we think there's nothing there, we think there's no clarity, there's no spaciousness, we lose touch with that expansiveness of our own mind, because we can't see, we're in the fog. But when we can get a perspective and just lift out of that, even temporarily, get that lightness that can see it from above, then we can get this, a better sense of perspective on what's happening and not take things quite so seriously or get so distressed when we are in the fog, yeah? Because the fog comes in again and things close up, but at least you've seen that there's a blue sky above, yeah? I often remember that actually on a really miserable day in England. <laughs> so what are the, some of the, I'm actually doing quite well for time today. Wow, this is great. But I did want to talk about some of the benefits of uh, of meditation and of developing the perception of lightness. And uh, yeah, another benefit I think is that we don't buy in so much to our thinking process. Yeah, we don't take that so heavily either. And the thinking process is something that can really tyrannize ourselves and anyone else. <laughs> yeah, you really see this if you're in a long retreat and sometimes everything's going well and then something just pops up, usually some problem in life, because we want something to do, right? We want to make a problem so that we've got some reason to kind of come back and start worrying and doing something about it again. And something comes up which seems quite small, but then it just goes on and on and on and we proliferate. The Buddha had a lovely word for that called papancha, proliferation. <laughs> he had a love, another lovely word actually with that, um, what's the word for that, on top and up and up or something, there is a word anyway, when the words sound like what they mean, and that's uh, the word sampapalapa, <laughs> which literally means a kind of um, useless speech, sampapalapa, you know, just blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and we have this going on a lot as well in our mind, right, and in our life. <laughs> So I think that, you know, we can't necessarily overcome thinking. And, and I think if we try too hard to, oh, that's it. Thanks, host. Onomatopoeia is the word for when a word sounds like it's meaning. Onomatopoeia, yeah. Great. I think it might be French. I'm not sure. Or Latin. Um, so, yeah. What was I saying in our life about, about people, about relationships, about talking to ourselves? It just helps us to instead of fight with the thoughts and think, oh dear, I've, I've got to overcome these thoughts, we can simply allow them to be there, but not buy into them so seriously, you know, not make such a big deal about it. We don't have to believe what the thoughts are telling us, right? Imagine if we believed every thought would be so confused because the thoughts contradict themselves all the time. 
I mean, I've noticed if I wake up in a good mood, then the project's going really well and I've got the most wonderful team and there's actually loads of support. And, you know, I can imagine living in a beautiful village with lovely trees and English summers are gorgeous. It's the best temperature in the world. But if I wake up in a bad mood and I'm sort of grumpy, I haven't slept that well. Oh my goodness, I can't handle another day of this. You know, I've been working so hard for five years. You know, I've not been with my teacher or my community for five years. Oh, nobody else has to go through this. You know, and then I imagine myself in England running a monastery. It's grey, it's dark. <laughs> so we just create these different worlds, these different universes based on buying into our thoughts and moods. Another thing I'd like to just mention before I do give some time for question and answers is... Um, that to help with this practice of lightness, some of the qualities that we can cultivate are things like metta, love and kindness, yeah? Mudita, joy, rejoicing joy. And joy, I think, includes gratitude, joy, rejoicing in our own goodness, rejoicing in our own success and fortune or our own uh, ethical conduct is a kind of gratitude towards ourselves, right? A generosity of heart. So these kind of uh, practices are really helpful just to give ourselves, again, some perspective and also some love and some warmth. And these states of metta and mudita in particular that I want to uh, just mention, uh, all of the Burma Viharas are see, uh, discussed as immeasurable states yeah? because the mind literally does become immeasurable. It becomes expansive, broad, vast. And the metta and the mudita also becomes vast and can literally include all beings. Of course, this is a very exalted state and it's not that we're going to experience this right away or even the most seasoned practitioners may not experience this all the time in every metta practice. But it's like putting drops in a jar. You're just inclining your mind towards these lovely wholesome qualities. Even every time when you think a thought of loving kindness, a generous thought towards yourself or someone else, you know, you give somebody the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they didn't mean what they said or they didn't mean it that way. Perhaps I interpreted it wrongly because I know they're coming from a good place. I see their qualities, yeah? I see their goodness. I see beyond the irritableness or the little things they may do wrong in my mind. <laughs> So we give others this metta, this loving kindness, and we can do this throughout the day, any time that you remember someone or you find yourself speaking in an impatient way within yourself. You can just turn that around and say, oh, how would I speak to a friend? How would I actually, how can I phrase this in a different way that actually gives me some encouragement rather than tries to put me down? Yeah, and of course, the prolonged practice of things like metta and mudita, when they become established in the heart and um, become an abiding that you can go to again and again, you actually do start to notice how perception is malleable. Yeah, and again, this is part of lightness. We don't always see things the same way. When I have a mind of metta, the whole world looks soft, it looks light, it looks beautiful. I see people's kindness, you know, even the suffering seems somehow poignant and even, you know, helps to open the heart when the heart's really resourced and full of metta. And yet the similar situations or the same people, they appear completely differently when my mind's small and hard. So we start to see not only that that things change, but also kind of how our perceptions are actually conditioned by whatever, by however we cultivate our mind. So we can't change what we experience, but we can change the way we relate to what arises. And I think this is really the liberating potential of the Buddhist path. This is what makes it so powerful because if we had to have everything just right, we'd basically be stuffed. I mean, there's COVID happening, there's all kinds of political upheavals happening, there's fear, there's worry, there's poverty, you know, there's racism, there's anti-racism groups being attacked by the other groups. And <laughs> My goodness, so many divisions amongst humankind, right? Let alone all the harm we inflict on animals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
if we don't develop some kind of inner resource, you know, some kind of way that we can bring a different way of relating to these things, then we're really going to suffer and just take on that suffering of the world. Yeah. So qualities like metta and mudita and even this lightness, I just want to make clear that these are not escapes from suffering. These actually help us to edge towards suffering by being more resourced. Yeah. Because if you just go straight into the middle of suffering with a very gung-ho kind of heroic attitude, you're going to get really exhausted really fast and, and then make some pretty bad um, judgments and, and decisions. But if we can really take that time to resource ourselves, to get that sense of perspective, get some lightness in our mind, then we have a lot more space to be able to navigate different situations and to know our, um, how much we can help and where we're limited, where we cannot go beyond. Yeah? So this is where equanimity comes in. We do what we can. We come from a place of loving kindness, compassion and sympathetic joy. But eventually, you know, when we've given it all that effort, we have to also understand that we are subject to our own conditioning and all beings are subject to their own conditioning. We can try our best, but basically we have to let go. People have to find their way. We have to and lastly, I just like to mention patience, because patience is part of gentleness, part of being light, giving things time to work themselves out, giving people time to grow, time to change. Yeah, because nothing goes according to our schedule, it goes to according to nature. And that's really okay. If the journey takes longer, don't worry, you can put more drops in the jar, you can you have longer to practice kindness, gentleness, and love, right? So everything we can experience in life, if we can develop these beautiful attitudes and wise ways of relating, wise ways of looking, and keep our mind inclined and aligned to the path, then nothing is actually wasted on this journey. It just helps us to dig deeper within ourselves, yeah? We don't always see it at the time, especially if anyone here or anyone has gone through extreme suffering, depression, grief, despair. We all go through that from time to time, but I know for some people that can be, you know, for many, many years. But yeah, there is an end in sight. There is a perspective and there is a way you can learn to relate, to let things be and to just keep on trusting in the purity of your intention and in the goodness of the human heart. So that's enough from me. Seems like I've said quite a lot in a short time. <laughs> and I hope there was something in there that could have been taken on board and may have helped you, perhaps uplifted your mind, or maybe something you can perhaps try out in your daily life. Just get a bit more spaciousness around whatever's happening. Take a pause, take a break, get some rest before you're already exhausted on the floor. So don't take things too heavily. And yeah, not only meditation is too important to take seriously, I think the whole of our life is too important to take too seriously too. Because it is finite, we are limited, we are going to die. So don't take things too seriously. Because I had a little scare, not a serious scare, but a small scare that I could have had, well, I could have had only a few years to live, had this uh, melanoma spread. But in the context of that, and in the week when, a couple of weeks before I actually knew what the prognosis was, all the petty concerns just flew away. It was really sobering in a very beautiful way, actually. And I was able to connect with the kind of general essence of my life, the general quality, like the main sort of inclination of what my life's about. And that was really quite moving in ways I didn't expect. So, you know, take it lightly and tread lightly on this world. Very good. So, <laughs> as I said, we're now going to continue recording, but don't worry about that. If you want to ask or say anything, you won't be on video. 
if you don't even want your voice to be on record, that's fine. Although it is lovely for people to hear people's voice, except mine. Uh, but if you don't want that, then you can put a question or comment in the chat box or any feedback or anything you'd like to share. And it'd be nice to hear from you about um, what lightness means to you, perhaps, or how you could bring some more uh, lightness into practice, even what are some of the obstructions, maybe. Okay, so I think, shall I let my co-host who's organizing this decide who to unmute? You might have to speak there and say who you're unmuting so that I can. So whoever's doing the unmuting, could they please unmute themselves and say the person's name? Okay, I will unmute Rob. Thanks. Ah, thank Hi you. Rob. Thank you for unmuting Derek. <laughs> so, um, I just wanted to ask, as a professional meditator, <laughs> um, can you give us some advice? On... Oh, me? <laughs> I thought you meant you were a professional no, meditator. You're, you're a professional meditator. Am I? <laughs> yeah, go on. <laughs> um, I was wondering whether you could give some advice or maybe tell us what you do as a maybe on a daily basis, what you do. Okay, what um, I do, huh? Okay. All right. Or not do, or what you don't Yeah, do. that's the thing. I try to do less, but I can't try to do less because that's doing. So it gets kind of convoluted. Yeah. Um, you know what I really have um, done for the last 10, 11 years since meeting my teacher, Ajahn Brahm, is quite different from what I expected. Because what I expected was to be cultivating breath meditation and focusing more on the breath, right? Like really kind of, building up samadhi in that way. And yet what I realize is that that's the wrong way to go about it actually. And it's the focusing on the breath that's always given me quite a bad uh, relationship to breath meditation in the past. And I think the reason that he touched me so much with his, the first talks I heard was his emphasis on loving kindness and just developing contentment in every moment. So then it didn't become about watching every breath. It became about learning to just develop true and deep contentment with this one moment. And from there, as the mind starts to calm down, the breath starts to arise in the mind. So that's been my approach for the last 10 or 11 years, mainly like developing a lot of loving kindness, really focusing on right attitude and intention, right relationship, if you like. And then just gently nudging the mind or gently inviting the mind to see the breath. So it's quite a different way to go about it. And I feel that probably even more important than that is the input that I'm actually getting. The, Ajahn Brown calls it brainwashing, but it, I mean, really what it is is conditioning from a wise, a wise teacher and allowing that to be my guide. So I actually sit down and I just recollect the beauty of this moment and the fact that I've got an opportunity to practice, the fact that this is my time out, this is time to relax, to do less, to put things down. And then I establish a kind intention and the rest, I just let it, let it happen, basically. Um, confident that I know what meditation is. I've got good teachings, it's all in there, but now is not the time to try and make it come together. It's not the time to kind of fabricate anything. Now's the time to just let the Dhamma do the work. So that probably sounds a bit odd. I don't know, that may sound a bit strange, but it's again related to that trust, so that trust that we have everything we need inside us. It's just a matter of creating fertile soil. Yeah, we have the fertile soil through our ethics, through our virtue. And then in the meditation, we can shine the sun on that or we can water it or whatever you want, however you want to imagine it. And that the little plants, you know, of, I don't know, maybe jhanas or even enlightenment becoming big trees, they'll come up in their own time. So that's basically what I do. And sometimes I do metta. I, that is a little bit more active. So sometimes I actually practice metta formally and in my groups on a Saturday, sometimes we do that. We um, visualize a person and we actively send loving kindness to that person and we start it off by using phrases. But again, you know, it's just an offering. It's just one way in to metta meditation. 
And my intention is always to start to calm the mind down. So after a while, once the metta starts to flow, I don't need the words, the phrases anymore. And the metta just becomes more and more of an embodied emotional um, experience. Yeah. But I would really recommend if anybody wants to do any particular methods that metta is something that shouldn't be skipped. I just think it's so fundamental to the whole path, especially since our very motivation for practice should be coming from compassion and metta, not from a sense of lack or a sense of self which wants to attain. You know? When it comes from a place of compassion and kindness, it's a totally different thing. That includes the letting go, that includes all the factors of the path. Yeah. So I hope that wasn't too much of a long, a long answer or a confusing answer, but, but yeah, <laughs> I guess that's sort of what I try and do. <laughs> Are there any comments or feedback on that or anything else people would like to say or share? There is a message in the chat box. Okay. This is from Kelly. I'm working on a project on character education. Would you say that character is really just another delusion resulting from conditioning and character education, the cultivation of good qualities, but not leading to a static character as such? Yeah, I mean, with everything in the Dhamma, you have the sort of more, I say more, um, um, so you have the relative and you have the absolute, but there is no real absolute. <laughs> but we have to live in the relative world, right? And for conventional purposes, we have to use the word I, you, me, mine. Otherwise, it's just too confusing. So, of course, you know, we have to, I think the word character is quite a good word, actually, because it's different from personality. Character to me seems to carry something quite nice in it, something quite ethical. Um, someone who has character or who has a good character is usually someone who can be trusted. Um, it is a, a accumulation, in a sense, of, of good qualities. Yeah, you know, strength, loyalty, um, being honest, being kind, being patient. These are all good, the qualities of a good character, right? So... I wouldn't necessarily say it's a delusion. I'd say it's a stepping stone. So it's important to have, I think, I mean, some people might disagree, but I do think it's important to have a healthy sense of self before we start to deconstruct our self, so-called self. Because like I said, some people come to the practice from a sense of lack or feeling not good enough. And they're actually bringing quite a lot of self-hate and aversion in. So sometimes they may feel they're coming in for positive reasons, but actually there's a lot of rejection of themselves. And if they then come and think, well, it's okay because there's no self, they can get attracted to Buddhism because, oh, there's no self, so I can just reject this self. I don't have to deal with this self anymore. And that's not healthy because we do have to develop you know, all these qualities of the path in relationship to ourself as well. So it is important to develop a, a good relationship with ourself and that will naturally bring around good qualities. So it sounds wonderful character education. I mean, I'm not quite sure exactly what it is, but it just sounds great to me that they're actually looking at educating the person rather than the person's knowledge, the person's brain, you know, the person's qualities are more important, right? So to me, that sounds really good. So I wouldn't worry too much about that, but it can be helpful also to see that everything is just conditioning because, because it's conditioned so we can affect it. If these people had a fixed personality or character, there'd be no point having character education. So even within that term character education, it carries the understanding that qualities can be developed. So see it more like qualities being developed than people being improved upon or or whatever it is. Presumably you're not educating them to be bad characters. I just presume that's the case. <laughs> Very good. I can see Alyssa has her hand up. I don't know. Hello. Hello. Hi. Oh, it's good to be here. Thank you for taking my question. There was a few things I wanted to share. Can you hear me okay? Perfectly. Okay. So something you had mentioned about Ajahn Brahm reminded me of 
uh, how he said it in a, one of his talks was, we, we don't have a free will, we have free won't. <laughs> yeah. I love that, right? So, because it really makes you remember. Um, also, from the retreat, you had mentioned about um, in your meditations, and it was so helpful for me to hear is you give yourself a lot of time to get settled you know I guess whatever you when you need that time and it was just so helpful to mm. me it's like you don't have to rush you don't have to find the breath because probably that's more like trying to like they say like herding cats you know if you just <laughs> it'll it'll so that was very helpful just to hear it like that I give myself a lot of time yeah and time to settle in right and Ajahn Brahm does that a lot he gives time to you know so thank you and another thing was talking about humor and and also I like to think of it as like that playfulness you know mm. kindness and caring and warmth can also be very playful um and to do that with myself and those narratives and to say well look at that narrative <laughs> there you know what a strange narrative to you know <laughs> about looking for some attention and love and what you want you know but really just to have fun with it because it makes it that softer more malleable more yes you know. absolutely so, so thank, you. thank you so much this is wonderful thank you oh well thanks for reflecting back because I love to hear you put that into words and explain it that way and I think um yeah, we hadn't really touched upon how we can have fun even with the difficult thoughts, right? And that's really important that we can just be like, oh, look at you, there you go again. You're quite quirky really, aren't you? You know, <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> and it, it helps so much. I mean, even when I say that, I get a different angle on things, you know, because it's like a loving way of speaking, the way you'd speak to a young toddler or whatever. You wouldn't say, hey, you're not meant to like, I don't know, tip the biscuits all over the floor or whatever. You'd just be like, oh, there they go again, you know. <laughs> Your little clots or whatever it is, yeah. <laughs> so that's that's really great. Uh, thanks for that feedback, yeah. Definitely playing, being light around ourselves, giving ourselves some space, for goodness sake. Let up on yourself once in a while. <laughs> yeah, good. Is there anything from anybody else? It's lovely to see everyone. Oh, look, I can see my friend Nick having his copper. I can see lots of people. <laughs> Jess, nice hairdo. Snap. <laughs> it's really nice. Uh, so anything else? Is there something in the chat box, perhaps? Let me check. Thank you for offering an antidote to judging others in the act of cultivating kindness and gentleness and remembering that they, like us, are simply a product of causes and conditionings. This is very helpful. Yeah, yeah, it is. And it's also helpful not only in the judging others, but forgiving, I think, forgiving ourselves and others for our so-called mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, there's one more question I see come up. There's, there's two more questions. Oh. Mike also can stand up, so we'll go to Mike first. Okay. And that will be the last, I think, because I, I do want to try and end on time. So we'll take those two questions. Oh, hi there. Um, hi. I've, I've been listening to Ajahn Brahm's talks for, for quite some while, so I was really pleased to come across your details and things to, um, oh. to your project and what you're doing. Um, it was just really a, a question sort of, uh, being relatively new to um, Buddhism, is there any recommended um, books or, or readings that you could suggest as an introduction to the sort of the Dharma's teachings? Yeah, I was looking to see if I had a little book right next to me to just show you the cover, but there's a really lovely book about, um, I'm, I'm directing you straight to the Buddha's words, but um, in a nice way, because there's a lovely compilation by Bhikkhu Bodhi who's a great translator of the Buddha's words, like the, the suttas, we call them, you know, the Pali texts. And he's got this lovely book on uh, called Social and Communal Harmony. Bhikkhu Bodhi, Social and Communal Harmony. Um, and it's maybe this big, it's a paperback, so it's very easy to read. And there's just lovely sections in there 
um, sort of put together according to themes, according to subjects about things like uh, community, friendship, anger, feedback, giving feedback, um, how to live in harmony, things which are really practical to daily life, but, but they're straight from the suttas. And he gives a sort of explanation at the front of each chapter, you know, a sort of um, his own uh, uh, way of explaining the contents of that chapter, very beautifully done. So that's one, which is really great. Um, it depends, like if you want something quite meaty about technique or something more heart opening and general, I would always recommend any of Ajahn Brahm's books. Um, but the one that's uh, the sort of bestseller that's the most accessible even to non-Buddhists is called Opening the Door of Your Heart. And it's basically a book of stories which seem at first, I mean, they are entertaining and light, lighthearted, but they're also very deep. Um, and they have a lot of lessons, but it's not a meditation book per se. Um, meditation book, maybe you could, I mean, I could recommend Mindfulness, Bliss and Beyond, but it's kind of talking about really deep states fairly quickly in that book. So it's a bit of an expert's manual, but it does emphasize approaching these things properly. Um, there's also things by, say, Bante Gunaratna, like, what's it called? Mindfulness, I think, or is it just called mi Mindfulness in Plain English? That might be a good one. Uh, anyone else want to suggest a book? If you do, please write it in the um, box. If you're really into the suttas and the Buddha's words, then there's a bigger anthology by Bhikkhu Bodhi called um, In the Buddha's Words, <laughs> which is also very good. I'm sure there's loads of books I'm forgetting to tell you. There's also a good book by Sharon Salzberg, who's a lay, a lay woman, just called Loving Kindness. And that's all about how to practice metta. And as I said, I think metta is a really important uh, core practice to have. So, yeah. I hope that helps. I hope that's a start. I've given you some work, actually. <laughs> Great. Okay, yeah, Kelly says, Ajahn Chah's Food for the Heart. If you want to look in the chat box there, quite a few people have put some, uh, some little suggestions. Okay, one more question from Danilo, I think. Is that right? Yeah, hello to everybody. Hi, from um, Italy. Yeah. I would like to share um, a little follow up from uh, the retreat uh, with Ajahn Brahm, which fits the um, theme of this, this evening. Um, what I brought back was the um, centrality of Metta in the other Brahma Viharas. And uh, I really liked what Ajahn Brahm told you before the Vasa retreat to set contentment as, as a goal. Yeah. So I, I brought back to the center uh, meta practice, which felt a little bit in the periphery of the practice and, uh, and contentment. And this, uh, besides improving uh, dramatically the, the quality of formal meditation, but brought a very soothing and peaceful sense of lightness in, in mm. everyday life. And this week I got two uh, bad news, two worrisome news, but quite surprisingly, after just a, a really short moment of, oh my God, what I'm going to do now, uh, a very compassionate and uh, I would say uh, wise reaction of the mind, mm. uh, kind of, uh, yeah, what, what can we do to, to care for these things? But still with this lightness as a background. Beautiful. And so, yeah, it's, uh, I, I couldn't believe in a, in a sense because I'm not used to, to react uh, to this kind of uh, news in, in such a very, I would say, very positive way. And this brought even more happiness to the, yeah. to the overall situation. So, yeah, thanks again. Oh, that is so advice, wonderful. Advice is... That is so wonderful to hear. And that's really thanks to that gem of a, you know, instruction from Ajahn Brahm. I'm very glad that that resonated for you, you know, to make contentment the goal, because that really 
made my retreat work for my three months reigns if I would have started turning it into three months where I had to get this or that state it would have been miserable it wouldn't have been a retreat at all so these sort of teachings are very powerful and I think that what you're describing is is so beautiful about the practice is that you've been planting those seeds for some time I mean you've been on retreat in Perth and you've just been on retreat again now with with Ajahn Brahm and um over time you start to get conditioned in a different way and and these conditionings come up when you most need them and isn't that wonderful and also that you could actually delight in that and that brought you happiness to see that the path is working that's really great because one of the things that um I also think is important as part of daily practice or at least to do whenever you can is to reflect on your practice reflect on the qualities that you're developing and actually bring that up in your mind and, and learn to get some joy from that and it seems that you know for you Danilo that was what was actually happening you were you know getting the contentment coming up and then also simultaneously feeling very pleased about that and feeling the the benefits of the practice so that strengthens your faith you know it strengthens your faith your faith in the path so that's why we bring up these things in our mind it's not to praise ourselves oh you've done really good today I mean even if it is it's okay right it's okay to say you've done well you've thought a kind thought or you've done a kind deed because it encourages you to keep practicing and it encourages confidence in the past it's not about me as a person. It's about putting this cause and this result is the effect. So the Dhamma is an amazing thing in a way so simple. No? You put in this kind of input, you get this kind of effect, but you, it's not always so obvious that one's related to the next, but you just put them in you know, continuously and you'll see the general direction of your life is moving towards more contentment, more inner peace. So wonderful. I feel really uplifted now from hearing from people and about their own practice and just being in this lovely group again. So I hope that everyone can take something away and thank you very much for contributing and being part of this session, uh, especially to the people who've come for the first time. It's always lovely to have um, new people logging in. So please feel welcome anytime. Uh, and the next talk is in two weeks I think so not next Sunday but the Sunday after next week is the meta session on a Saturday morning so it's like one week Sunday one week Saturday like that there's also a uh, three-day retreat with me over the new year well actually it's the last three days of December so you're free on New Year's Day um, and then yeah I have Ananda Bodhi another bhikkhuni a wonderful bhikkhuni who actually Nick Mangalo who's here he'll know her from Amravati in the past but she's been a bhikkhuni a while now and she lives in California and she'll be giving us a talk on the 11th actually, isn't it? It's the 11th, Friday the 11th of December at 6 p.m. So the details are on our website, yeah? Probably, yeah, I think the website's already in there. And uh, yeah, we need to end by just inviting Mel to say a few words on generosity, that's right. So. Thank you, Hi, Mel. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I really, really love that talk this evening. Thank you so much. I'm really inspired. I'm sure we all are as well. Um, I just wanted to offer a few words on the uh, Buddhist practice of dana to the community. Um, dana meaning generosity in Pali. And it refers both to the act of giving as well as the donation itself. Um, so the Buddha teaches that dana is a very important part of our spiritual path and our practice. Um, it serves as one of the foundations of our practice. So it can help us because it can help us let go of that sense of, of our own self-interest and, and help cultivate the mind of joy of mudita and loving kindness and compassion that Venerable has been talking to us about this evening. Um, so just uh, to say that there's many ways that um, we're able to support the Anacampa Bikini project, um, either by donating on the website or if it's uh, easy for you to set up a standing order, that's always helpful. And any funds that you generously are able to donate, if you are able to, um, go towards not only the day-to-day -day living um, of Venerable, but also the wider aim of establishing the first Bakuni monastery in the UK. 
So thank you very much. And I, I'm just going to take away trust in, in the purity of your intention and the goodness of your heart. Sadhu. 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 That's also a very important part of levity. <laughs> you actually define gravity. <laughs> thank you, Mel, for those lovely words. And thank you, everyone, for being here. It's been absolutely delightful. And uh, we're usually on mute you all now, or we give you permission to unmute just so we can hear your lovely voices saying goodbye. So please feel free to.